there were moments where people were saying, you know, walk away, Frank. You, you made a mistake, accept the mistake and walk away. How do you maintain the conviction but stay sane and in a place that you're not hating yourself? Sometimes in almost every deal, you're gonna have difficult moments. Sometimes those moments will be like the world is imploding around you. That's how it feels. Mm -hmm. And you just have to just fight it out, stick it out. People think that I, you know, I'm a workaholic. I'm not. Rip the concept down to its studs, remove all assumptions, and that's just great practice. You can apply yeah. your business, your life anywhere. But I learned enough to be dangerous. <laughs> what I love to do is, is introduce the right people to the right people. I assemble the smartest people I can think of or reach out to to carry that conversation, and that's exactly what I've done today. Please give my panel a round of applause. Welcome. Okay, my next guest is Frank Justra, legendary Canadian business tycoon, entrepreneur, and investor. He's the founder of Wheaton River, which became Gold Corp, one of the world's largest gold producing companies. But Frank's been all over the map. He's a founder of Lionsgate Entertainment, producer of many of the Hollywood films that you probably know and love. Uh, he's also the chairman of Fiore Group of Companies, which backs early stage businesses in a variety of sectors, including the natural resource space, and they have a fantastic track record of finding and backing top tier management teams with great assets. Enjoy. Okay, Jay Martin here, CEO of Cambridge House, and I am joined by Frank Justra, the CEO of Fiore Group of Companies, among many, many other things that we're going to get into today. Frank, how are you? And thanks for joining. I'm great, Jay. Thanks for having me on. This is great. Okay, so for anybody who's not familiar, uh, you know, we're talking to Frank Justra. 1980s transformed Yorkton Securities from a small boutique uh, investment bank into a major force in the international mining finance scene. Uh, exited that industry months, like months prior to the Briex scandal that ended up tanking that industry. Timing was really exceptional. In 1996, founded Lionsgate Entertainment, a firm that, I mean, a lot of people watching this channel will know these movies, American Psycho, Fahrenheit 9-11, and several others. Uh, but in 2011, after being fully emerged in Lionsgate, you pivoted back to the gold space, published some articles that were somewhat provocative. You look like, how am I doing? 2001. 2001, 2001, did I say 2011? 2001, that's right. Um, and writing some articles that might have come across as somewhat provocative at the case, arguing for a new case for gold, mainly against the backdrop of the US dollar. And in the interim, there's been several other pursuits. Fiore Olive Oil, uh, consistently ranked one of the world's best, if not the best, olive oil in the world. Uh, my pantry's always got some. Um, and uh, uh, Modern Farmer, uh, Thunderbird Entertainment, uh, notwithstanding Wheaton River, which became Gold Corp. That was what you, you know, after you published these articles, you put your money where your milk was and, and went full on back into the space. Um, 2014, Dalai Lama Humanitarian Award. 2019, Order of Canada. 2020, Co-Chair of the International Crisis Group. Look, there's, there's tons more, that, uh, but I don't want to do all the talking. So, um, Frank, when I run through, you know, your, or when you reflect on your career, here's where I want to start. Because um, there's been so many industries, pivots, directions, and successes. When you reflect back on this, was there a point in time where you felt like you moved from fighting and hustling into a place more of providence, like things began to click and start to facilitate your passions? Uh, well, I think there were two pivotal uh, moments uh, when that happened. One was in 2001, when I wrote those first uh, of two papers on uh, making a case for gold, and then the subsequent launch of Wheaton River, which became Gold Corp. Um, I was very, relaxed and uh, comfortable in that space. I hadn't been very comfortable when I launched Lionsgate. It was not my, you know, it was not my world. I was doing something very bold and very risky for someone from outside the business coming in and trying to launch a major Hollywood studio. Um, so it wasn't my comfort zone, but when I, when I started writing about gold in 2001, I was, um, I had such conviction about what I was saying. Uh, not a lot of people believed it back in 2001, but I had a lot, I had a lot of conviction and I assembled a group of people that were, you know, the uh, people that were subsequently involved in, in the creation of Wheaton River and um, made my pitch. Uh, initially, it was, there was a lot, very lukewarm reception, but eventually everybody came on side and they came outside because I had such conviction about what I thought was going to happen to gold. And that was the genesis of the creation of the Wheaton River 
uh, company, which eventually became Gold Corp. Um, it was based on that, uh, the view on gold. So I started from a macro level that I was very comfortable with mm. and, um, and believed in wholly. So um, that was the first time. The second time was really after 2005 when I realized that I wanted to change my life, that it was not going to be about business 100%, that I really wanted to spend more of my life in the philanthropic world. And that really evolved from 2005 to 2007 when I launched the, um, what was then called the Clinton Justra uh, Sustainable Growth Initiative uh, with former President uh, Bill Clinton, um, and which is now called Accesso, is, and I've taken it out of the Clinton Foundation since, and it is what I announced in 2007 was this was gonna be my life's work. Mm. I didn't realize I was gonna get into a whole bunch of other initiatives subsequent to that, but it is still my main um, focus in philanthropy is a, it's a poverty alleviation initiative in Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, but I've done other things since, uh, including, you know, being involved in crisis group for 15 years. And now I'm the co-chairman of crisis group, which is an international organization that looks to end and pre or prevent or end deadly conflict around the world. It's, it's the best organization for doing that, um, anywhere. And I love, love the people that I work with there. Uh, we do a lot of good in the world. Um, so really, <clears throat> at that point, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I became more at peace with myself. I really found what it was that I wanted to do in my life. And more and more, I've um, gone into the philanthropy and, and less in business. Although I love to dabble in doing deals and, you know, investing. I, I no longer want to run anything. I don't, I, I don't want to even be on boards of public companies. Mm. I love orchestrating stuff and, and, and being involved in, in the creation of ideas and putting my own money in, but uh, that's as far as I'll take it. The rest of my life is all about philanthropy and learning. Got it. Which is kind of, I mean, I know you do a ton of mentoring as well with uh, I do. up and coming budding entrepreneurs. So it's a nice blend. And yeah, I've heard you say about 80% of your time these days is spent in philanthropy. Keep 20% for business. Yeah, I keep 20% for business, but um, it's less. It's becoming less and less because, as I said, I'm no longer involved in the direct, you know, day-to-day -day stuff. Um, yeah. Just on the, you know, idea side, you know, thinking about things that are interesting, putting money into things, and that doesn't take that much time. Got it. Okay, now with your background at Yorkton through the 80s and early 90s, it makes sense that when you came back to the markets in 2001, you felt like you were at home, right? You said, yeah, I, I understood the macro trends driving the narrative for the small cap ideas. It all makes sense. What I'm more curious about is then what prompted the pivot? I mean, in your words, uh, Lionsgate was not your world, right? Uh, so what, what drove and inspired that decision? Well, it was, you know, I, uh, two things. First of all, um, I was very tired of the investment banking business. I was chairman and CEO of Yorkton Securities up until 1996. I was 39 years old. I told myself forever, I, I had been telling myself forever that I didn't want to remain in the business past the age of 40. Um, and I, I made that promise to myself and I was tired of it. I was tired of managing, you know, dozens and dozens of investment bankers and everybody, you know, <laughs> competing over, you know, my attention and, you know, and the, the pool of capital that was being distributed. It was just, it was, became very dull for me. So mm -hmm. I decided I wanted out of that first and foremost. Um, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do when I left. When I left in December of 96, I didn't have a plan. I just was happy oh, to God. not have that burden uh, any longer. I, I didn't, I thought that the market the, the mining game was getting very toppy, very frothy. There were a lot of really dumb deals being done. Everything was overvalued. I thought, this, this is a perfect time to exit. And so that's when I left Yorkton. But um, the Lionsgate thing was always, in, the idea about the film business was always in the back of my mind because I'd been dabbling in the film business since 1986. I started a, a, a company that very few people know about uh, called the International Movie Group in 1986, which I uh, raised the money for and, and launched. And um, that's how I learned about the film business. It was a very small company doing a very specific part of the film business in foreign sales and eventually some production. But I learned enough to be dangerous <laughs> from, from that experience. And I, you know, I, that company was in existence for about seven years. While I was still running Yorkton, I had this on the side. I, I owned shares in it and I was traveling around 
the world learning the film business with my then partner in it. And I, like I said, I learned enough to be very, I'd always been interested in movies and the, the art of movie making just fascinated me since I was a little boy. I just loved movies. And uh, then I learned the business part of it and that gave me enough confidence, probably <laughs> misguided confidence to launch Lionsgate, which was a whole different can of worms. And Lionsgate was a very large undertaking very ambitious, probably too ambitious in the mm. beginning. Um, it, it was hard, hard work keeping Lionsgate afloat until we sort, sorted things out and kind of focus on our core business, got rid of all of the ancillary stuff that was just, you know, noise. Um, and and uh, that took three years of my life, very a very stressful three years of my life to get that in, 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 in good standing so that we could bring in the right management the right financing, which we eventually did by 2001. Um, but uh, yeah, and it was an incredible learning experience. Um, I'm glad I did it. I wouldn't want to do it again, but uh, it was certainly uh, an interesting phase of my life. Yeah, well, you just this week published a blog post on, uh, I mean, so it was a scenario where essentially you almost lost the company, right? And maybe this speaks to your point about coming out too ambitious maybe not doing the deal properly, exactly. uh, which everybody should read this. It's on frankjuster.com. Uh, it's called um, Tell to Win is the blog post. And uh, when you're describing being in the hotel room, waiting for the phone call that would determine your fate, like I felt like I was in the room with you. It was really, really, really fun. Well, the uh, blog was about storytelling. And as you, if you read the whole thing, it was really a book review about my friend Peter Guber who wrote the book Tell to Win. And I thought, what a great way to start the story that it was actually him that I did the deal with back in 1997 that, uh, you know, put me in, you know, a lot of hot water because of the nature of the way the deal was uh, negotiated, which was entirely my fault. I take total blame for negotiating a bad deal for us. And then I had to live with it for the next three years. And then the fact that he then ended up writing this amazing book, which mm -hmm. is about storytelling and the art of storytelling to you know, galvanize people around you, sell your vision. And it's an amazing book. Should, everybody should read it. Anybody that's in business should absolutely read this because it, it, it really nails the concept of how storytelling galvanizes people, gets people emotionally involved in your vision, mm. which is far better than sitting up in, you know, in front of a room and with charts and data and numbers. People get very bored with that sort of things. So, yeah, everybody should read that. FrankJustor.com. I, I write it every couple of weeks or so. I write a blog on various subjects, but that this one was a good one. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. Okay, so maybe you just touched on it, but I was going to ask, you know, what's the core lesson that came out of that scenario at Lionsgate? The core lesson, well, there were there were there were two, which I, I, I talk about in the article. Uh, when you're doing something, this is, by the way, something that served me very well since. I never made that mistake again to rush into something to try and you know, do too much at once. Um, and I learned, learned the art of patience. So when you're building something, a company, for instance, be patient, do it methodically. Don't try and, you know, conquer the world overnight, which is what I was trying to do at Lionsgate. Um, and and, and, and it, it's been my experience that to build a good company, I've built or been involved in building quite a few companies in my career, it takes three to five years to to really get it right. You know, you have to have that sort of patience. It's not going to happen overnight. And if you're going to do it right without making silly mistakes that are going to put you into hot water. So, so that's number, the, the, that was the first lesson I learned. The second lesson was perseverance um, and never give up. Um, you know, I, <laughs> the Lionsgate years were, there were moments where people were saying, you know, walk away, Frank, you're, you, you've lost this is not going to work out. You, you made a mistake, accept the mistake and walk away. Let the company go to chapter 11. Um, and I kept looking at these people like they had three heads. I was going, you know, are you kidding me? Quit. I'm not, I'm just not going to do that. I can't, it's not, it's not in my DNA. So, you know, sometimes in almost every deal, you're going to have difficult moments. Sometimes those moments will be like the world is imploding around you. That's how it feels. Mm -hmm. And you just have to just, fight it out, stick it out um, until, until you succeed. And that's, you can't give up. Too many people give up in this world. And I just, I, that's one thing I just do. I do not quit. 
Now, now talk to me about, because I think, you know, that, that narrative, you're right. Like a lot of people can relate to that battle, right? Unique to their own circumstance in life. How, how do you manage the mental health, Frank? Like how do you maintain the conviction but stay sane and in a place that you're not hating yourself and your life? You know what? Um, and uh, in my same blog, frankjuster.com, you'll go scroll back uh, uh, to five articles I wrote two years ago called The Five Secrets to a Balanced Life. And it was a series of five articles uh, that I did over a period of a couple of months. Each of those articles pointed to one area that I believe will give you a balanced life. And you have to have a balanced life to keep your sanity. And that's, you know, honestly, my people think that I, you know, I'm a workaholic. I'm not. I, I don't work, you know, 12, 14 hours a day. I never have, even when I ran Yorkton. Um, uh, I believe that th there are a certain number of hours that you should dedicate to your work. And, you know, for me, it happens to be early, say, 5, 36 a.m. till about 1 or so, where I'm focused on doing whatever I'm doing. And then find other things to do in the afternoon. I love to learn. I love to learn new things. So I'm always reading new books or watching documentaries about things that fascinate me. Learning is a great way to keep a healthy mind, keep stay balanced, um, have your passions. You know, like I, I, I love to cook and I love food and I love the food world that sort, you know, that has taken me into other businesses like Modern Farmer Magazine, which I own and the, the Domenica Fury Olive Oil, which as you mentioned earlier, the best olive oil in the world, which is my passion. So hobbies, passion, family and friends, you know, I love to entertain with my family and my friends. So, it, you know, I, I believe in spending a lot of time, which is quality time with people that I love. Um, and, um, and, and philanthropy. So to me, it's not all about, you know, the money part of it's interesting. And I know people will always say, well, you have the money, it's easy for you to say. But I found this to be true, not only in my life, but in other people's lives that I know that if you focus only on the money aspect of what you do, you're going to be a very unhappy person. Uh, you'll never be happy. So for me is, um, you know, finding an outlet for all of the wealth that I've created. And that is my philanthropy. And I love giving back. I absolutely think it's my, I, I, it's an honor to do it. I feel privileged to, to be in a position to, to help other people in many different ways. So, you know, I just keep a very balanced outlook on life. I don't, you know, I, it's not all about money. It's not all about work. It's about enjoying a balanced life. And, and I think I found that balance and I, that, that's giving me peace. Okay. I'm definitely going to dig up these uh, five articles, the five secrets of a balanced life. Thanks for that, that tip. Okay. I, I do want to pivot a little bit to the gold market because uh, that's what you've done three or four times in your career. And, you know, uh, fa famously, yes, in 2001 with uh, the, formation of Wheaton River, which became Gold Corp. And the, I mean, the list of names associated with that deal from Rob McEwen, Ian Telfer, Frank Holmes, like it's, you know, it, it was such a melting pot of talent. But let's fast forward to today, because, um, you know, I appreciate your perspective, because you're not always bullish on the gold market, right? And in, in this industry, there's a lot of people that are right, gold's always going up, uh, US is always going to crash. And I understand that that narrative sells. Uh, but when someone who isn't a perpetually bull, uh, perpetually bullish suddenly becomes, that's when it gets interesting to me. And um, I heard you in the interview relatively recently, um, maybe reflecting back, you said in 2016, you guys have been pretty quiet at Fiore Group when it came to the resource business, but you gathered the team in the boardroom and said, okay, it's time to start looking for deals, right? Um, so talk to me a little bit because historically, your, your, the articles that you published in 2001, two and three were largely tied to the fate of the US dollar driving the gold price. Is that still the narrative that charged you up from 2016 to today? Yeah, partially, but not entirely. So um, first, let me back up a bit. Um, when I get bullish on something, anything, I always start from a macro point of view and I think, okay, what's happening in the macro world that's going to shape my view about uh, where I should look for opportunities. And, um, you know, it was interesting uh, after the 2008 crash, um, you know, people thought we were going to go into a depression and that everything was and in a depression. Everything crashes. Everything falls apart. It's all asset classes go down. Um, and uh, the only valuable asset class in the depression is cash. Um, and I said, no, that's not going to happen. And 
I made a case for gold in 2008 and nine, and that's when we launched Endeavor Mining was in 2009, because I believed that we were gonna have a really amazing gold run because of the amount of money that was, was being printed back then and, and the various quantitative easing efforts by the Fed. Um, so that ignited that gold market that went from 2009 to 2011. So here's what happened between 2011, 2016, and it took a lot longer than I thought. And by the way, um, by 2013, I was thinking this is ridiculous because I couldn't believe that the market had been fooled long enough by this charade the Fed was creating that they would be able to raise rates. And I said, you can't raise rates. I was saying that as soon as 2008 happened, I said, it, rates are going to zero and they're going to stay at zero because it would be absolutely impossible to ever raise them again because you're printing all this money. But what happened that made it even worse was all of the debt that started to accumulate worldwide because money was free. Um, so you probably know this, but debt has, global debt has over, tripled, over tripled, uh, sorry, so it's doubled from 2008. It's about $277 trillion of global debt that's double from what it was 10 years ago. And so I kept saying, they will never raise rates. They can't, it's mathematically impossible. And I was interviewed a few times and had debates with journalists about this. It was like, show me how it's mathematically possible you're gonna be able to raise rates without imploding the world economy, without imploding the markets. And now that situation has got even worse in the last 10 years. And by 2000, so what happened in 2016, the Fed finally blinked. They, you know, they would started to incrementally raise rates at a quarter point at a time. And, you know, they were gauging what was going to happen because of their actions in, 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 in the interest rate, uh, setting interest rates. And I, and they blinked, <clears throat> they stopped raising rates. And I, at that point I said to my guys, that's it, that the bell just rung mm. and they're not going to be able to raise them any further. And I guarantee you at some point, there's a recession coming and they will drop rates. We'll have to go back to zero. Um, and so uh, I said, let's start doing, let's get active again. And that's when we created Leia Gold. Mm -hmm. uh, Leia Gold, which is now part of Equin Ross Beatty's Equinox. We, we merged with his company uh, and I'm still a shareholder. Um, that was the reason I went to Neil Wood. And I said, let's do it again because we had just, uh, we had created Endeavor Mining uh, which was a number of mines in West Africa back in 2009. Mm. Control changed uh, um, uh, of the company in 2016. And I said, fine, great. This new group now has Endeavor. That's great. Let's create another one. And that was a layer of gold. And, th and the reason I did is because I knew that the gold market would now start to really clue in what was going on. They'd been, the market had been fooled long enough that rates were going to be able to be normalized. And, and to me, that was always an impossibility. So by last year, by 2019, I was absolutely convinced that the bell had really rung on the gold market. Gold, the gold market was the third wave of the gold market that started in 2001 um, <clears throat> was about to start. And you know, I went very public with that view uh, in August of 2019. I said, it's game on. Gold is going to really go through the roof this time over the next few years. Uh, this is going to be the biggest, most explosive uh, uh, run of uh, phase of the gold bull market that we've ever seen, and that's um, and I still believe that to this day because they cannot raise rates. We are at zero interest rates forever, and that's a mathematical certainty. It's absolutely there's no way you're going to be able to raise rates without imploding the bond market, the global economy, and the stock market, and. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just not going to happen. We're, we're Japan 30 years ago. You know, it's, it's, it's the same thing. It's the rates are going to stay at zero forever. The only difference this time is that there's nowhere to run to. The dollar was the last haven in terms of something that actually gave you some sort of a positive return on your money. And now when the world is at zero interest rates, at least the developed economies are at zero interest rates, where are you going to run to? The only place you can run to is gold, gold or other hard assets. Um, you're not going to get a return on anything else. And so I think that all of the volatility is going to shift from <clears throat> uh, uh, from uh, 
the economies to, to, the, to, to the foreign exchange markets. And, and then it's going to be a question of who's going to win the race to the bottom because everybody's doing the same thing. And so in a, in a race to the bottom, the only thing you own is something you can't print. And that's gold and other hard assets. Maybe it's real estate, maybe it's other things. Certainly mm -hmm. stocks gets, get, get, get some of the benefit, but even stocks are hugely overvalued today. Um, so they're due for another correction at some point. So, you know, I, I think that gold is really one of the very few answers to where to put your money to at least protect your wealth. Yeah, you know, it, you bring up an interesting point and it's, it's hard right now to find an undervalued market, right? Uh, if you look at real estate, often all time high, it's US equity market, I, I wouldn't touch it. But even gold, you know, if I look at the performance of my gold equities, uh, the gold price, you know, we're also hitting uh, record performance, right? And, and it can be quite challenging. But record performance relative to what? I mean, gold, you know, relative to the Dow, you know, gold relative to a lot of things, uh, you know, it's just relative to the money supply, you know, mm. everything's relative in this world. So, you know, there's, so in an overvalued world, how overvalued is gold relative to everything else? I would say very, not overvalued at all. It's actually very undervalued mm. relative to the other asset classes. So you want to have this enormous, we have this enormous amount of liquidity in the world because all of this free money has been created. It has to go somewhere. And when things get grossly overvalued in one sector, it shifts to another. And I think that people are going to wake up because I think the money printing hasn't ended. You know, when Biden gets in on January 20th, I don't think it will take very long at all to get a, another stimulus package through Congress. They'll agree to some number in the $2 trillion uh, uh, level, and that money has to be printed. It doesn't exist. You know, mm -hmm. the Fed has to end up monetizing all of that government debt. That's what's happening. It's already started, and it's just going to get worse because they're digging a deeper and deeper hole. So I think that right now you're seeing gold plateaued sort of in the $1,900 level, you know, give or take $100 here and there. It's been fairly steady holding there. The next run is going to come after the next stimulus package. You know, when people realize, okay, this isn't ending. This is going to be ongoing. It's going to be a never-ending cycle of printing money. And that's, unfortunately, there's no other answer except to monetize all that debt and inflate away all of that debt so that it's worthless you know, you owe all that money, but <clears throat> what do you really owe? You're, owe, you're owing worthless currency mm. to, 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 to the lenders. And that's how they're going to get out of this thing, by inflating their way out of it. Right. Now, I mean, inevitably that stimulus will also inflate the equities market again, most likely. It, it, right? it probably will until some event happens, mm. like March, like no one predicted a pandemic. But, you know, we're certainly this is not a v-shaped recovery like a lot of people were hoping it was going to be a v-shaped recovery it's we're going through a second wave right now a global second wave it's mm -hmm. happening as most of us knew was going to happen um and so that's certainly not going to ignite the economy and we're going to go into a, another this is going to be an on rolling depression for for a number of years until we sort out this global debt problem I mean, the, the world's over levered and we're you can't grow when you have that much debt. Mm. It's impossible. We have to restructure somehow. I'm not sure how that restructuring is going to take place, but it's going to have to happen some, sometime in the next number of years. It, 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 we need a right. global monetary restructuring. Now, what's that going to look like, Frank? I mean, what? I, I don't know. I really, I, honestly, I wish I did. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. But would, certainly, it, would it be possible for central bankers to revalue gold? Yeah, that's possible as a partial solution. I think it's possible. I think that uh, one thing for certain, the U.S. dollar will not be the reserve currency when it's all over, okay? Mm -hmm. It'll be something else, and I don't know what that is, whether it's a combination of things, whether it's another currency, um, but certainly I think gold will play a role. I, I don't think we're going back to a gold standard. Mm -hmm. I think that's really going to be very almost impossible to do, but I think gold will play a role in backing some form of new global currency, or maybe it might be several different reserve currencies who knows because you know the world certainly is not unified at the moment uh, right. in, in terms of all this stuff so i don't know yet but i just know that i would be very wary of owning dollars uh in the long term like it, it you know i think inflation is going to eat eat them up eat up the value of the dollar okay 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 i want to talk about 
uh, your portfolio a, a little bit. Maybe I'll, I'll start with a, a question, a hypothetical question, Frank. Uh, given everything we've just discussed, where we are today, you have $100,000 and your time horizon is five years. You can absolutely not afford to lose that purchasing power. Where's the safest bet right now? Gold. Uh, if that if that is your um, if those are if that's the uh, the, the, the parameters that you're giving me. You don't want to lose emphasis, and you don't want to lose that's, the that's value the of that. Then just buy gold and just put it in a in a vault and forget about it. Okay. Uh, that's now you might you know you're not going to get a, a rate of return on it, but it's certainly relative to other asset classes going to do far better than bonds. I mean, the one area I wouldn't be in is bonds. Hmm. Absolutely okay. not. Um, so cash, you know, cash is going to get inflated away. You need some cash. We all need cash, but certainly I wouldn't have hundred percent of cash. That's the dumbest thing you could do. So if you, if you're just worried about preserving, just buy gold bullion and forget about it. Okay. Now I'm going to flip the question a little bit. You have a hundred thousand dollars. Your time horizon is still five years, but this time you can absolutely afford to lose the money. So where's the most exciting speculation? I think gold stocks, because they're going to get that. They have the, uh, uh, they're levered to the, to the, to the gold price. So, you know, you think about what it costs to produce an ounce of gold in most mines today, you know, uh, let's say it's like, call it a thousand dollars an ounce of all in a uh, sustainable cost. Um, you know, a $2,000 gold, that's your thousand dollar margin. What happens to $3,000 gold? You know, it just, you know, you, and then you apply a multiple to that and, you know, you have to own the gold stocks, the gold royalty companies. Um, and you have to be very selective there, obviously, because that's a much different game than just owning gold. You have mm. to really understand what you're doing. Um, but yeah, definitely not. I, I, if, if that were the, you know, if those were the parameters, I'd be, I'd be buying. I'd have some gold bullion and quite a few gold stocks or gold royal, uh, or royalty companies. Okay. Okay. Now. I've heard you say in the past, your, your main criteria when looking at gold equities is, you know, the great asset, the great management, and something that's ideally grossly undervalued. Uh, in addition to key bullet point, a company whose balance sheet is built so that they're able to weather a storm if it occurs. Do those rules still apply today as much as they did? I heard you say this in 2012. No, they, they absolutely apply today. And, uh, and I think that if you look at the way that the, the gold miners are behaving, even in this latest run in gold, it's it's with a very cautious attitude about how to, you know, not uh, overload their balance sheets with debt and how to not make dumb acquisitions that have no accretive value. Um, so I think that, uh, and I think that that's going to hold for a while. By the way, I don't think it's going to hold forever mm -hmm. because the temptation, as gold price, the gold price starts going higher and higher, the temptation to get out there and you know, get bigger and bigger will always be there. It happens in every sector, not just the gold sector. Every sector that has a long bull run gets frothy at the end, and that's when the mistakes are made. But I think certainly for the next couple of years, you're going to see a very disciplined uh, mining sector. Mm. Yeah, and we've seen that. I mean, that, that happens, right? The money becomes cheaper, easier to yeah. access, less barriers to entry, more people in the space. Investment bankers calling you, going, you got to do this deal. It's <laughs> Yes, yes. It's, yeah. I mean, I've always, I've always figured that my, uh, the, uh, the luckiest thing that happened to me in this industry is that I, I joined the precious metal sector in 2011, right? And so there was like six months of, of party and then eight years of pain. And it was the best thing. I mean, the best way to cut my teeth in the sector because anybody who was after that easier, quick buck, they had to leave. Anybody who stuck around, you know, they were willing, they were there to work, you know. Uh, it allowed me to, to learn faster, upgrade my network. Um, yeah, it was fantastic. Okay. Um, so, so last question on the gold market. Uh, when are you going to know? Because I've heard you say, you know, some of us buy gold and plan on never selling it. If anything, it's the legacy gift you pass on to your children and grandchildren. Uh, but I, I have heard you say there would be a time to sell right? Yeah. Uh, when there's some parabolic spike caused by maybe a black swan events and the price goes through the roof, that's yeah. when you move that, that value, that purchasing power to something else. Yeah. Um, does anything come to mind? Like, are we, are we close? I know you said we're in no. that sort of, okay. no, not even, we're, we're not even close yet because we, uh, we haven't had that parabolic move yet. It hasn't happened. You know, the, a, a parabolic move is like what happened in the 1970s. Uh, at the end of the 1970s when gold just shot from like, it was, averaging around $500 an ounce and it just shot to, you know, $800 an ounce. And, and that was a parabolic and it happened very quickly. 
mm -hmm. a very short period of time. Um, uh, in 2011, it had that big run to 1900, a very, very quick move. Now, having said that, I would have never thought that it would have gone back down to 1,000 as it almost did after that run because I, I, I couldn't get my head around why do people believe we're going to normalize interest rates? It's just, and I just, but the market stayed fooled long enough that it did happen. You know, it, it, it almost went down by half. And so, uh, there's to me and, and listen everybody's going to be have a different view on this to me gold should always be part of your portfolio a, a certain amount of it okay so you know that that because that is your hedge against everything okay and and in in, in in traditional portfolio management before wall street convinced everybody otherwise uh back 30 years ago 40 years ago in traditional uh, portfolio management there was a gold component in every portfolio five to ten percent gold and then that sort of was, it became unpopular and Wall Street said, you know, gold is a relic and people believed it and, and, and you know, we're, we're coming into this market with very few people having gold in their portfolio. But I always believe there should be a certain amount, but there's a time to be overweight, which is now, mm. okay? And I'm hugely overweight. You know, most people would probably, you know, have a heart attack owning that much gold because um, it's, it's a very large part of my net worth. Um, but I'm so convinced about what's happening. What's happening is what's happened throughout history. This time will be no different than every time that has happened before when they just when governments destroy currencies. It's it's happening, and it's 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 by the playbook. You know, it's it's the. Yeah. So I believe that now is the time to be overweight in gold. Now mean mean different things to different people. Sure. But sure. certainly, at least ten percent of your portfolio should be in gold. Mm. And there will be a time when in the next few years when gold will spike and it will really and it'll surprise everybody people go oh my god who would have thought gold will go to that number whatever that number is and it'll happen very quickly and uh and it'll be inspired by some event it could be a geopolitical event you know another pandemic who knows you know something that is causes major fear in the marketplace and um or it's some inflation starts to run away which i mm. think is very very possible over the next few years um and then people will just panic buy into gold um and i've always said you know uh, panic now avoid the rush because it eventually will happen and um at that point gold will do something very crazy and you may want to take most of your position <laughs> out at that point and put it into I don't know, real estate, maybe stocks will be super cheap then. There will be other things that will be undervalued at that time. And mm -hmm. that's when you rotate your portfolio. But it's not now. I think now is the time to position yourself in gold bullion and some gold stocks and wait for that run, which will happen over the next few years, and wait for that moment when things get absolutely nutty. And you have to be very tuned in and not, and not get sucked into the view that it's a forever thing that gold just keeps going forever because it won't, you know, it'll go to, it'll go to a level, probably a pretty high level, but then it'll come off. That's the hardest part. I mean, I, I feel like buying is the easy half, right? Selling's the tough part because as the price appreciates, all it does is it reinforces your conviction that this was a good idea. Exactly. And, you know, and we're all um, subject to that, to that, that feeling and in, myself included, like, you know, it's hard to kind of step back out of and, and, and start drink, stop drinking your own Kool-Aid and go, mm. wait a second, what's really going on out there? Um, the only time I got fooled uh, was, like I said, um, I honestly thought that the market would have caught on quicker to the, to the Fed's charade about normalizing rates back in, you know, 10, 10 11 years, 10 years ago, eight years ago. Um, and um, it took a little bit longer. I mean, they kept the market fooled for a long time. And, you know, sometimes you just have to wait. But the macro view hadn't changed about what was actually happening and the, and the reasons why you should own gold. But, yeah, there will be a time to sell gold or sell a lot of your gold position, um, but it's not yet. Right. Okay. Okay. Awesome. I, yeah, and I've heard you, you know, I know you don't price predict, uh, which I appreciate, but I think the closest thing was you said pick a number. I probably wouldn't disagree with you. You know, with all yeah, the audacious because, forecasts that are out there. Well, no, because you know, I've, heard, I've heard some crazy numbers from some very well-respected people that I know well, okay. um, friends of mine. And I always go, oh, well, that's interesting. 
<laughs> Great. Right. I, I, hope, I hope you're right. Um, but, you know, I would never make that kind of a prediction. But they may be right because what will happen if there's a dollar crisis, if we really, if people, if the printing gets out of control and inflation really starts to kick in, it's a self-reinforcing cycle that it creates. It, it, it forces the Fed to dig deeper and deeper into a, you know, into a game it can't, it can't possibly win, but it gets out of control. And that's at the point that if, if we come to a point where people lose faith in the dollar uh, and really panic, which could happen, um, then, then all bets are off and then name your price. Like, you know, right. If, if you get into hyperinflation, which is a possibility, sure. high inflation is a possibility. Hyperinflation is a possibility. If that happens, pick a number and, and it can be any number because you know that you can't control hyperinflation. It's, 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 it, it simply just destroys until everything's destroyed and you can restart with new rules and new, new currencies, new, you know, it, it, you have to go through the destruction period first. And yeah. so in, in that scenario, gold could go to some crazy number. That's the real value, I think, of being a student of history, because it's so easy, you know, we're conditioned to believe our future will reflect our immediate past, right? And it's yeah. hard to imagine those scenarios um, actually impacting our life, especially, you know, I was born in Canada, very fortuitous, right? Predictable, safe, all the right things. Um, and it's hard to wrap your mind around that scenario actually unfolding, hyperinflation actually occurring in my currency? No, it's not gonna happen, right? Never, yeah, okay. Uh, so thank you. You know, so, sorry, the Spaniards said that, the French said it, the, 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 the Dutch said it, the British said it, you know, yeah. it's never gonna happen in my currency. <laughs> right, yeah, of course, when you're, when you're in the vacuum. Um, okay, a couple last things I wanna touch on. I know you have a, a personal passion for, for quantum physics, quantum mechanics. And I'm curious, first of all, as to why, and I would consider myself like a surface level recreationalist in this uh, subject matter, but it has piqued my interest and often impacted the way I look at reality and my life. And so what, what interests you and why are you drawn to this, Frank? Okay. Now your viewers here might think, you know, they're going way off top of the world and it's going to probably invalidate everything I've said about gold because people go, that guy's nuts. Um, but uh, yeah, the, 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 interesting, the interesting thing about quantum physics is that it suggests that reality as we know it, you know, our macro world that we were seeing, you know, with things being in fixed locations and, uh, and, 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 and identifiable as one thing or another, is not actually how it works at the quantum level. Quantum level is the subatomic level. That's the particle levels of, 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 of atoms. And the rules that, uh, the, uh, that uh, dictate that world are very different than the rules that dictate uh, classic Newtonian physics, which you know, we know that certain forces are in play in, 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 in motion and gravity. Um, and then, you know, so we had that, and that was easy to understand, um, you know, in Newtonian physics. And then we get, uh, when Einstein came up with this theory of relativity, that really was a difficult concept to accept that time is fungible. It, you, know, you, you can dilate time, and space-time is one thing, and the only constant is the speed of light. That was kind of a weird concept, but we've proven that that over the years, we've, in so many experiments, we know that's absolutely true. That's why GPS has to be calibrated um, to take a, into account the gravity slows down time as you're getting closer to Earth, and it's going to be faster as you get higher into space and, and away from gravity. Um, so that was, but that was a weird concept. And then it came quantum physics, and that's really bizarre stuff. And it breaks a number of rules of the macro world that dictate our reality and the, and the two main ones are entanglement and superpositions and and just without getting into you know <laughs> into into quantum physics i'll try and explain in a very simple way so entanglement means that two particles can be separated from um from from an atom and they're entangled particles and you can separate them across very uh long distances and they will effectively communicate with each other, uh, which breaks the, you know, the, the uh, Einstein's uh, cardinal rule that nothing travels faster than the speed of light. Mm -hmm. And, but you can, 
and we've proven this in experiments now that we take these particles at further and further distances and what you do to um, say stimulate one particle will instantaneously happen in the other particle at great distances so that violates the rule that nothing travels faster than the speed of light so there's that and there's the really weird one which is superposition um, uh, and you can't determine the location of a particle until it's observed and that's a weird concept but all particles exist in a range of probabilities it's called the probability wave until and so the particle could be here it could be there it could be both places at once until it's observed by a conscious observer mm -hmm. and uh and they've tried all of these very sophisticated experiments to try and trick the particle into believing it was not being observed and in the in the most sophisticated of all the experiments that they created the particle actually went back in time it was a wave function and then when it realized it was being observed it went back in time and reconfigured itself as a particle all weird stuff right so it, it tells us that we don't quite yet understand the way the universe works and we think we understand it but i it's my belief that you know our understanding is so far off that there's a reality that we can't conceive because we don't have the the uh, mental capacity um the brain power to conceive what that reality is but there's something going on that we don't get about reality and then that takes you into all sorts of other areas about you know i wrote an article recently which you know was pretty out there but it was about the simulation hypothesis mm. that, that this is a simulation and you've heard other you know very well known people like elon musk has talked about the fact that this is the 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 odds that this is base reality are one in billions you know that in in, in there's a thing called bostrom's theory which i wrote about in the article which <clears throat> suggests that it's there's a one in three chance that we are not base reality that this is some sort of a simulation of a very <laughs> advanced intelligence that preceded us and you know you can make it you can make a scientific case that that hypothesis might be true um so but it's all because we just don't understand the universe yet we really don't understand so much that we that i think you know 50 years from now 100 years from now maybe a thousand years from now our our if we survive that long as a species we're, we're going to be aware of a reality that today would be seen science fiction or fantasy right yeah okay man so much in there to unpack and you know i'm i'm aware i'm treading in dangerous water here because any of these rabbit holes that i go down i'm going to be completely lost in but you know what i took away from uh from your passion in, in quantum mechanics quantum physics is really if you are somebody with that inherent curiosity and thirst for learning this is like the holy grail because it's such a black hole of wonder right uh and there's some real comfort i find in not knowing maybe acknowledging that we don't know you know how reality really functions um and for anybody you know the simulation theory is fascinating it's you know i guess looking at how far we've come in building virtual worlds today and how close they've become to mimicking our reality and how therefore how close we are to building a virtual world that is indistinguishable the question then is how likely is that this is the first time we've done this you know exactly. And, and, and that's Bostrom, that's Bostrom's theory. We, again, go to my blog, and uh, I wrote it about three weeks ago. It's called uh, "Is Our Simu Is Our Reality Somebody Else's Simulation?" I think that was the title of the article, okay. and it will refer you as because I, I couldn't pack. It's such a crazy and big concept with so much detail. I couldn't pack it all into a you know a thousand word piece. So yeah. I, I I put a lot of links in there if you're really interested that you could go and look at and other articles I've written about other things like artificial intelligence um, that you know you can really go down the rabbit hole on this if you, if you like like me that's exactly how it happened it started with a book that I read about 15 years ago called the fabric of the cosmos by um, Bill hmm. Green the, the physicist from Columbia University and that book just inspired me to read a lot more books listen to lectures I and mean, you can go on YouTube there are great lectures by some amazing um, physicists from all over the world uh, talking about various aspects of of quantum physics um, and uh, and and different theories about what gravity is we're still not sure what gravity is we haven't been able to really identify what it what gravity is and how it fits 
and, and into our view of quantum of quantum mechanics. So um, so you, know, you can really go down the rabbit hole in this, which is what happened to me. And then you know you'll never come out. It'll just it'll be because it's so fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating what mm. could be, what might be reality, um, which yeah. is beyond our comprehension. And it, yeah, it is. And it begs the question: once you go down that rabbit hole and embrace the simulation theory, like, but it's fascinating and, and, and temporarily alters my, maybe the way I think about reality at the end of the day, like, well, does it actually change what I'm going to do today? You know? <laughs> yeah. Do we have free will? That's always been uh, in a lot of philosophers, philosophers have always argued throughout the, you know, throughout the eons about whether we truly have free will. And there's a lot of science that suggests that we might not. A lot of right. brain study science uh, suggests that, you know, we think we have free will, but the decision is made before you know that the decision is made. Okay, okay. Yeah, that, gets, that gets into really crazy stuff. But I, I'm just yeah. saying to your viewers, if you wanna have fun with this, um, it's really interesting stuff and it will just make you think. It's an incredible way to just think outside the box what, what the possibilities are. Mm. And it's a good practice. It's a good exercise, right? Yeah. And that creative destruction thinking mindset, right? Yeah. Rip, rip the concept down to its studs, remove all assumptions. And that's just great practice. You can apply yeah. to your business, your life anywhere. Okay. Um, I want to bring it back to earth just to wrap it up. But we talked about frankjuster.com for anybody who wants to stay up to date on the content that you publish. But you're involved in a number of philanthropic endeavors, uh, street to home being one. Any directions you want to point viewers who are curious? And anything you want to touch on, Frank? Well, uh, you're right. My my philanthropy. I've got. I think I have a total of three and soon to be four foundations dealing with different aspects of philanthropy. There, there's my anti-poverty initiative in Latin America and the Caribbean, which is called Accesso. Uh, that's A C C E S C O. Um, and that is run out of New York. Um, there is my crisis group, which I'm now the co-chairman of crisis group, which is based in Brussels. We have offices in DC and New York, and we have field offices around the world. Give me some examples of, of what the crisis group focuses on. Yeah, so we focus on uh, preventing deadly conflict. So it was inspired by what happened in the Balkans in the 1990s and by what happened in Rwanda in the 1990s. Two, two you know, genocides and, 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 and conflicts that could have been prevented mm. if the world had acted in time. And there was no one around to ring the bell to make sure and galvanize all of the actors that would have been necessary to prevent that outcome. So that was, it was started in 1995, uh, Crisis Group. I joined in 2005, <clears throat> went on the board of uh, Crisis Group 2005, became chairman this year. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's made up of uh, the, the Board of Trustees are many former heads of states, former foreign ministers, journalists and academics from all over the world. Uh, so we're well represented. It's like a mini United Nations. And in a world where the United Nations is very dysfunctional, it doesn't work anymore for peacekeeping and preventing conflicts. Uh, it, it works obviously in the humanitarian side, but we are it, in my opinion. We're the ones that uh, have people on the ground in all of these areas of conflict around the world that produce research from the ground by trying to talk to all sides, okay, and coming out with an unbiased report of what's actually going on, what the possible solutions might be, and then we take those reports and those proposed solutions to the actors that we deem are necessary to involve in a peace building effort. And so what does that mean? Um, so we advocate, we lobby, we sometimes, as we did in Yemen a couple of years ago, create an overall campaign, a media campaign to prevent what will otherwise be a humanitarian catastrophe. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are involved in, I'll give you some specifics, uh, the Iran nuclear deal that was created back in 2013. We were instrumental in helping draft the ideas that then became that deal, which then Trump obviously overturned. Um, but that prevent that deal was put in place to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear uh, power. And so, but in a way that Iran agreed to it, everybody signed off. So that was uh, 
that the, the, the one that a lot of your viewers might be able to relate to is what we did in Colombia. As you know, Colombia suffered a 50 year insurgency war uh, from a, a couple of uh, guerrilla groups, the FARC and the ELN. It was a 50 year internal war, in, in essence, which really almost destroyed that country and created like millions of displaced people and, um, and, and obviously fueled things like the, nar the, the narco trade. Um, so we helped draft the agreement, the peace agreement between the FARC and the Colombian government, uh, which was under President Santos. When he was president a few years ago, he won the Nobel Prize, Peace Prize for, for doing that, and he gave us credit for doing a lot of the work that helped shape that peace agreement. So we try and do that in other locations. Um, obviously, <clears throat> one of the big ones is the, the, the Yemen war. There's, there's a civil war going on in Yemen, uh, and you have Iran backing, backing one group and Saudi Arabia and the UAE backing <clears throat> the government forces, and then they're all, and it's becoming even messier with other groups in there. So we've been instrumental in trying, and we actually prevented um, a, a campaign uh, by the UAE and Saudi Arabia, I think it was two years ago, uh, by, you know, by publicizing that this would have caused a, human, a humanitarian crisis that would have put about 20 million people on the verge of starvation. Mm -hmm. So um, we do a lot of that work, and it's important because no one else is, well, there are other groups that do it, but not to the extent that we do it. Mm. Okay, thank you for sharing on that. I, yeah, it's and then I do a lot of work in refugees. Uh, we have, I, know I, I got involved in the Syrian refugee crisis in Greece about right. four years ago. Did a lot of work there. Then in Canada, bringing a lot of refugees into Canada. Uh, and then we cre created a global partnership that was funded by my foundation, Open Society, the Government of Canada, and the UNHCR, and the University of Ottawa to take Canada's model of private sponsorship of refugees and globalize it, take it to other countries around the world. So that's mm. one of our initiatives. And then I do a lot of local stuff too. Here in Vancouver, homelessness is one of them. Um, mentoring uh, teenage boys at risk. I've been doing that for 23 years. Mm. We created the, the Boys Club and the East End Boys Club. Um, and that I think it's important to do things in your own community. Um, the uh, uh, emergency food drive we did during the COVID uh, when COVID hit in March, we created this emergency food program to deliver food to mostly elderly people that were unable to go out anymore. So, you know, you have to always be involved in a lot of the local stuff too. Uh, but most of my stuff is international. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Look, I've, I've used up my hour, Frank. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for not pushing back. I, I had a bunch of stuff I wanted to get into and and uh, you let me take the conversation wherever we wanted to take it. So I appreciate that. <laughs> well, I hope your viewers will be interested in quantum physics. Yeah, no doubt they will be. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you.